Yeah. Also good to see you this morning out of Lake Baptist Church. Welcome to our services here. Let's turn to number 58. 58. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? John W. Peterson. I love John W. Peterson. He wrote so many happy songs. Yes, he Songs did. about yes, God's love, did. the Christian life, and about heaven. A lot of happy songs he wrote. This is one of them. Let's all stand and sing it together. Number 58. <laughs> Just, I can't wait to get into the Word. I'm excited to be in church today, Amen. aren't you? And I want to welcome our visitors in just a minute. Father, oh Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for your promises. As your Word says, they are yea and amen. Lord, uh, the world can promise us all kinds of things and they cannot deliver. You do. We know there are immutable things, and that is you cannot lie and your promises are true. We just thank you for that. As we further study in the wonderful book of Hebrews, Lord, I, I can't begin to explain it. And I pray your Holy Spirit will be at work in our hearts today. I thank you, Lord, for these that are visiting with us today. I thank you, Father, for uh, helping people that have been battling various ailments and various ills and how that you have helped many of them to get back on their feet. And I just thank you for that, Lord. Bless our service. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Now, I'm going to introduce some visitors to you in the order that I first met them this morning. Um, and that is, first I met um, Giovanni Bellucci. Did I say that right, Giovanni? Close. Close, okay. <laughs> and that's, uh, I'll let you show me how you write it out, then I might pronounce it right. Uh, Giovanni's from Bulgaria. His parents are missionaries in Bulgaria. And so when everybody else gets to go home for spring break, and now he can't just go back to Bulgaria. He's got to have somebody let him come home with him. And I'm so glad that Chad did that, invited him to come and uh, to be with the uh, Kuingas for this week. Hope you can have a great um, spring break. It's such a wonderful time to meet you. And I'm, been, I'm pretty dense this morning. I could not grasp something. As I met, uh, actually not the first time I met these folks back here, although I met Patty for the first time. Patty Subject is with us this morning. Her daughter, Audra, and son-in-law, Sam, are our neighbors. 
And when he was trying to tell me his neighbor, I'm thinking in terms of the church and not recognizing. See, a, a few months ago, it was decent <laughs> weather. They had come down our driveway and met us one, one Saturday afternoon, I think it was. And uh, we were out there talking. We invited him to church and things like that. And I knew that he had his own business. He's, he's a, uh, I think, HVAC type thing. And uh, very busy in his business and so forth. And so we, I don't know, did you give them a pie or something? Or did you give them something uh, on their doorstep? Because we were worried about whether it would be seen or not. And um, so we're so glad that you guys came to visit today. Make sure you meet Sam and Audra. Vandenberg is the last name. Amen. And, uh, and, their, and Audra's mother is Patty. Make sure you meet her as well. We love having visitors. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, I had a blessing this week. Mary and I went up, and we got to be with Dave. Uh, Dave got to come up from where he lives in, in Greenville and go to um, a rural church conference at Lakeview Baptist. I really enjoyed both messages. Uh, Dr. Zane Aberger is the pastor there, and he preached a wonderful message on prayer. And then uh, Brother, I cannot remember Brother Wilkerson's first name. John Wilkerson who is the pastor of First Baptist Church of Hammond and the uh, head of Hiles Anderson College was there. And I have heard him before. I got to hear him out in California one time and really got a blessing, but we got to meet him, talk to him. So that was really a blessing, wasn't it, honey? Yeah. And uh, a funny thing happened. This, all the preachers were standing up and they were uh, introducing every preacher to tell who he was. And there was this pastor that had some big guys with him and it, Pastor Zane said, uh, well, who are those bouncers you brought with you? you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, they were laughing. So when it got to me, I said, I brought my bouncer, my wife, Mary, you know. And, uh, I didn't get in any trouble. She's pretty good about me doing stuff like that. But yeah. It got some laughs. But anyway, I was glad to have her and Dave. And I met a man, a group from Black Lake came over, Brother um, Garth Hutchison's. And we used to support him. I don't know how many of you have been here long enough to remember Brother Jim Lynn and his wife Jane. We used to support them through Continental. And he uh, was a church planter. And he was there that night. So we, we connected. Like after 25 years, we saw each other across the room. We were waving. And I thought, I know this guy. I know this guy. I know this guy. I knew his first name. I couldn't think of his last name. And he said the same thing. I knew him, but I couldn't think of his last name. So we got connected and that was really a blessing. So I just enjoyed that so much Monday night. And uh, I'm glad to be with you today. Let's sing some more, Pastor Mark. Okay. Let's turn over to 137. Sing another poetry by the pen of Fanny Crosby, Near the Cross.
this morning. Appreciate that. Thank you. Amen. Amen. All right. Let me just uh, go over a few things with you before we take the offering in a minute uh, that are happening and coming up. And that is uh, tonight. We'll be back here. Oh, before that, if I didn't, I mentioned it in Sunday school. There is a meeting right over here with Spencer about the van ministry. Okay. That's right after church. Okay. And so that'll be right here. And uh, the van ministry, there are as a sign-up sheet in the back for van helpers. And uh, we're thankful for our van ministry and the people that we reach because of it. What a blessing. Amen. Choir practice is at 430 tonight. And uh, so I hope you'll come back tonight. We'll be studying in Colossians chapter 2. And uh, Colossians, uh, there's some wonderful passages of Colossians that have been on my memorization list and something some of them I have memorized over the years. I especially love the first four verses of chapter three have been part of my thinking a lot. And there's one in chapter two that I'll warn every one of us. We studied it already, but we're going to continue in chapter two. And that was beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy or vain deceit. Uh, you know, that's what's probably happened to most Christians. We've been spoiled through Wrong thinking and vain deceit. Amen. Hope you come back for that study tonight. Now, ministry team meeting. Where is that happening, Mary? In my social class. Far end of the hallway? That's tonight. After the service tonight, there's a ministry team meeting. So uh, don't forget that, okay? And uh, we just thank God for meeting our needs, uh, supplying the monies that he has supplied uh, we are trying to get going on this building project. Um, the, the, the survey is in the process. Uh, the first thing we have to do, by the way, we've been talking about this at some meetings, but I haven't said a lot about it on Sunday morning. One of the first things we have to do is eliminate our septic system and connect through a pump system. That's going to cost about a hundred grand to uh, connect our sewer up the road. It's 750 feet. And it has to be pumped up there. So we used to think that we had to have a big old pump house. Not anymore. Everything's underground. As long as you have the power going to it, the pumps are underground. And so that's going to be a boon to uh, our church as far as not having the problems. I remember one year, 2014, when we had so much snow and ice that our septic system wouldn't work. Do you remember that? And we came to church one Sunday morning and somebody said, Pastor, all the toilets are backing up. Boom. So we couldn't have church that night. The next day, Bert, man, he worked so hard, got out there, dug out that hole, put a clean out. A man came and steamed it. He, he run a thing in there and steamed it so everything would flow. And we're not going to have that problem once we get this connected. So that's something that has to be done. But then someday, Lord willing, and not way off in the future, hopefully this year, we can break ground. That's my goal. That's my prayer. So keep that in mind. Well, um, this coming Tuesday night, we're going to be in Jeremiah 19. Thank you for coming and being a part of the prayer time and Bible study. That starts at 630. Mary's uh, ladies are in Proverbs 22. And uh, Wednesday, youth group at 630, Heroes of the Bible. It's a pizza night, by the way, for the kids on um, the Wednesday night group. And, of course, we pick up teens and uh, we pick up children from the van for with the van, and that's a blessing. Prayer meeting. Uh, I'm sorry that I missed last night, Bob. I know you weren't able to be here either, but I've missed prayer meeting a couple of weeks because of circumstances with Tom and Kara coming and everything. But uh, I'll try to pick it up next week, Lord willing. Now, tonight is a uh, next Sunday night is a teen afterglow. I accidentally said tonight. That's next Sunday night. On the 19th is the ladies' uh, special ladies' day out where they go down to Calvary Baptist in Quincy. And uh, I know that they're looking forward to that. And I know that Misty is looking forward to you ladies coming. She'll be really one. That'll be wonderful. And you'll see all the details without me reading this. If you need any questions answered, see Michelle or Norma, if you'll do that, okay? Um, then there's... A meeting next Sunday morning about the ladies who are going to this and so if you can pay it today it's only $30 I think it'll be what 35 next time after today and then you'll see a list I'm not going to read them 
this is what we came up with our planning meeting. This is a list of things coming up, but I do want to focus on something, and I know that um, it is a, a blessing that Dorothy wants to head up the mother-daughter tea. Do you see that, ladies? Did you know that was coming? It's in your bulletin, and it's on the 7th, and I know we don't have all the details yet. Starting at 2 p.m. 2 p.m. We'll make sure that gets in the bulletin next week. Thank you for uh, heading that up, Dorothy. And you have a lady that's going to be speaking? Yes. Wonderful. I actually babysat her when she was a little girl. Really? <laughs> Wonderful. And she's a pastor's wife? Yes. We're, she's the daughter of a pastor. Okay. For what part of the state? DeWitt. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I know you ladies will get a blessing out of that. That's coming up on May 7th. And many other things are going on. You'll see there's a Fort Faith Work Weekend. It didn't get in here yet, Jimmy, but your um, June 4th uh, Spring Fest will get in the bulletin before long. I know that's an exciting time. The June 5th, the uh, Longs will be with us, our missionaries out in Utah. And uh, what's happening next Sunday, actually, that you need to pay attention for Saturday night? Thank you. Don't want any of you coming here an hour early bothering me. <laughs> Dorothy did that one year. <laughs> After I had done it the spring before and missed Sunday school because we didn't change our time. So that's worse. It's worse to miss it in the spring. All right, men, if you'll come, we'll take our offering. Be sure to read about the Tingsons. They got a move. By the way, Mindy Tingson is with child. So pray for her. One of our missionaries over in Australia. So pray for her. All right. Thank you, Father. You've been so good to us. You've met our needs. And you always do. Help us, Lord. It's the least we can do. As you said to us in Romans 12, uh, that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice. In light of all of your mercies, Lord, may we follow through on that. Bless this offering, please. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
11 full. I just want to say again, choir practice starts again, uh, heading towards the Easter <coughs> service. We want to get prepared for that and sing some other songs along the way. So if you ever thought about joining the choir, today's the day. Just come in 4.30 to 5.30 is the choir practice. And you can just come take a seat up here and, and uh, we'll be kind to you. All right. We'll be kind to you. <laughs> all right. Our hymn of greeting is number 54. Oh, how I love the Savior's name. This may be new to a lot of you, so keep it, listen to it as she plays to it as we have our greeting. Then we'll come back and sing verse 1 of number 54. Oh, how I love the Savior's name. Let's stand and greet one another this morning and make everyone feel welcome. We can't wait to this. <laughs>
thank you very much. Looking forward to the message today from Hebrews. Before that, Tasha Smith is going to come. Look, where'd she go? Tasha Smith is going to come and share something this morning. Thank you, Tasha. actually called Go Down Again, and it talks about um, Naaman dipping in the Jordan River um, because of his leprosy. So that's the where it's coming from. I believe it's in 2 Kings chapter 5, if you'd like to read that.
Natasha. Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to Hebrews chapter 8, will you? Hebrews chapter 8. Now I introduced uh, our visitors this morning, forgot to mention their little guy is Everett. Such a cutie, about a year and a half old, and uh, praise God for that. Um, I'm just trying to picture it, Giovanni, um, is Bulgaria near like Romania and Hungary, things like that? It's right under Romania. All right. I'm, I like geography, but I get confused when I try to imagine Europe in that area. But uh, we're, it's so wonderful to have some visitors with us today. Amen? Amen. You know, it was on the last Sunday of January that I preached out of uh, Hebrews 7 in so we had the whole month of February was about the family. Remember that. And I want to get back into Hebrews today. And um, so by us having that much of a gap, I think you'll understand why I kind of need to have a quick review, if you'll bear with me. And that review is this. The theme, does anybody remember what the theme of Hebrews is? <laughs> supremacy. The what? I didn't hear you. Supremacy. The superiority of Christ. Because I'm almost deaf. I can't tell what people are saying. I'll just answer it. I shouldn't ask questions, all right? Because I can't hear well enough. And, uh, and you know, when one ear is screaming at you and the other one is trying, it, it's really difficult. But anyway, remember, we talked about the superiority of Christ. It starts off right away in chapter 1 talking about he's superior to who? Angels. And then a little later, it's uh, Moses. He's superior to Moses and the law and a superior to Aaron and the um, Levitical priesthood. And so we've seen that played out uh, throughout these first uh, seven passages. And, you know, there was a difficult passage in there. Chapter six, we, we, uh, I, I just really struggled in how to explain that. I prayed and prayed that God would show me something, and I felt like he did, something new that I never saw before, and I have taken Hebrews in college, I've preached through Hebrews, but in chapter 6, in that passage where it says it's impossible for those who have once enlightened and all that, and it says, if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance. Wow. The thing that hit me on that was some one of the writers, I can't remember which one, I don't remember who I read, said this. He said, Judas fell away. Peter fell. And that's when it made all the sense in the world. Falling away is talking about going into apostasy. Falling away is like P Judas, who was an apostate, and he even got sad about what he did, and he went back, and he threw that the silver down, and uh, they said, what is that to us? You know, they, they couldn't, you know, being so careful with the law, they took it and bought a field because he went and hanged himself. He couldn't find that place of repentance because he had fallen away from the Lord. He never had the Lord to begin with. Now the righteous can fall uh, seven times, but the Lord will lift them back up. And I love that passage in in Psalm 37, it says, The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, but for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. So just keep that difficult passage in mind with this thought. Falling away, apostasy. You might fall, and you will fall as a Christian. That doesn't mean that you're lost, okay? You cannot lose your salvation. Don't forget that. I also... Gave you my two cents worth about who I thought Melchizedek was. And I'll repeat that. I personally think that Melchizedek was an individual that it was Christ's appearance in the Old Testament. Uh, and that's why there was no uh, mention of his father or mother or beginning of days or end of days. And, and it could be, I'm, I have to admit that I could be wrong in that matter. And... Uh, you know, we who are married, we know what that's like. We know what it's like to admit we're wrong, right? But I can't be dogmatic about it. There are good people who uh, believe that you know, Melchizedek was actually an individual on the earth, and we just don't have a record of his 
father, mother, birth, or death. But that the, the key thing is that Jesus is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We read that phrase in chapter 7 about the power of an endless life. And that's one of the reasons I chose to choose that theme, that thought, that I believe that was a Christophany, Christ appearing in the Old Testament. So we don't know for sure, but I, I gave you my two cents worth on that. <clears throat> but I was thinking about that falling away. We see that evidence of that in 2 Thessalonians 2 also, where it talks about there's going to be a falling away first. And we see that all around us with the apostasy of different churches, the apostasy of different religions. They now deny the truth of Scripture. They're preaching social gospels. They're preaching all kinds of things that are not leading people to come to know Christ. They're making people feel good about themselves. And of course, uh, we, don't, we don't want to be a part of that. We want to stay true to the word of God. Amen? Amen? Well, here's an interesting phrase, and we'll look, read it, and then we'll pray. He says, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. I've entitled this message, Summing Up Superiority. Let's pray. Father, I just ask, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit to be upon your word as we read it, Lord. There's a lot more here than I can begin to cover. Uh, Lord, there's some need here. Someone will say, how does this apply to me? How does this affect the problems I'm going through? Lord, I pray that they might see it, that they might see who you are and what you are and what you do on a constant basis, even right now. Help us to understand that throughout this message. We thank you. I pray if there's anyone here that's not saved, may they come to know you today. And Lord, we just thank you for so many blessings. We can't even begin to count them all. May we always have a thankful heart. Bless now this message in Jesus' name. Amen. I brought something with me this morning. You might say it's an object lesson. Well, I'm going to read from it. And uh, Artel, you remember this book? One of the two that you gave me? Artel gave me this five years ago, it was September of... Uh, September of 2017, so a little, a little over four and a half years. And um, it was a book that belonged to Harold McNeil. And how many of you have been here long enough to remember Harold McNeil? Wonderful, wonderful godly man, Harold and Leota. What a character she was, amen? This book belonged to him, and he's got so many. Now, you you got to see all the writing he has in here. And um, it's about the tabernacle. It's written by a man named Edmont Haynes, Dr. Edmont Haynes. I'm going to share some clips out of it as uh, we talk about the tabernacle from this passage a little bit and their wonderful thoughts here. Some poems I'm going to read from it and uh, use it by way of illustration. But let's begin reading. Let's read the whole chapter and then uh, kind of uh, hopefully we can uh, do the ex expository preaching on it. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat to offer. For if he were on earth, he, would, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is the, was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, 
and I will write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which is decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. It's a daunting task to preach out of the book of Hebrews. I don't know who wrote it. I think it was Paul, but I, I don't know. I just, I know that he was deep. I know that he was very knowledgeable. He was very much trained in the law in such a way that he could talk. And it seems like he's talking over us in some ways. But if you will ask the Lord, and that's one of the things that we should always do when we approach scripture, we should humbly come to God and say, please show me something from this passage. And that's a good thing to do in your prayers. Don't come to the Bible with a preconceived idea. Come to the Bible ready to be changed by it. Come to the Bible with the hope because it is powerful. It's a powerful book. It is quick. That means alive. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, we've been talking about the superiority of Christ, and I've called this message based on verse 1, the sum of the superiority. This is the sum. First thing I want you to think about is the superiority of his sanctuary. You see the word sanctuary is found in verse 2, and this is in the first two verses. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Jesus is where right now? But where specifically? He's at the right hand of God. Now, he is different as a high priest than all of the priests in the Old Testament because they never sat down. They were never through. And you're going to see that when we talk about that in the next point. But this first point, the superiority of his sanctuary. Notice it says, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. And if you jump to verse 5, where he says to Moses, he says, See that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. I, I didn't master these things by any means, but I remember uh, blueprints when I worked for Pioneer. And uh, we would come in, and, and I was not, I was a grunt most of the time, but I did have a wonderful Christian pastor and friend, Brother Harvey Hammond, who was my supervisor, and he wanted to, Move me up. And so he elevated me to his right-hand man. When we built the school in Sparta, the elementary school, Ridgeview, I got to be on that project front to last. I mean, I was there on, on laying it out and there until we did the punch list and got done. And it was wonderful to be under this man. He made me his second man. I, I appreciated that. I don't know that I really deserved it, but I appreciated that. And so we would look at blueprints. <laughs> I thought I was studying Greek again. <laughs> It is, uh, it, you know, but some things start recurring and then they start making sense. And I didn't have to know all the things that um, maybe the plumbers or the HVAC guys know. What they're, all I had to know was what I had to know. And so there was a blueprint and we had to follow that blueprint. That's the way it is in building. And I always liked how these, uh, oh, this is just a side note. I should not criticize the uh, architects, but they always had this thing kind of like covering themselves called field verify because sometimes they draw something that was impossible to build so that's why you had to they had a stamp on there field verify make sure that you could really build this <laughs> you know that kind of tickled me but we had blueprints you had to go buy them and the, the lord is saying to moses be sure that you build this what the tabernacle that's what this whole uh, book by dr edmont haynes is about the tabernacle and all the gleanings that he got out of there and i'll read some of that in just a little bit but uh he says make sure see that thou make all things according to the pattern so if he had a blueprint do you think there was a sanctuary in heaven that's the way i gather it when i read this he says the true a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So it sounds like in heaven, God has a perfect tabernacle laid out. It might even be uh, in relation to the whole um, throne of God and everything in relation to how everything is patterned. 
when we get to heaven, we might see some amazing things about that in this true tabernacle that's up there. I'm sorry, but I don't see a whole lot in the Bible about that true tabernacle. I just see it alluded to right here, a true tabernacle. But one of the things that Dr. Edmont Haynes says in here, he says everything in the earthly tabernacle, everything in the earthly tabernacle points to Christ. That's wonderful. And he tries to draw that out. So it's kind of wonderful. But I want to read a couple of poems and a couple of things that you know, just this man had a real heart. This first one's not a poem. This is the guy talking about wood and gold. He says, and if I were to stop here at wood, he said, I would have no message for you or for myself or anybody. For I would be absolutely messageless. And furthermore, I would have a wilderness tabernacle made only entirely of wood. Because the wood in the wilderness tabernacle represents the humanity of our Lord. Incidentally, it was acacia wood, the wood that grows in the desert like a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire. And he's quoting Isaiah 53, of course. But the wooden boards of the tabernacle walls were covered with magnificent gold. And the gold represents the deity of our Lord. This is seen very plainly when one considers the golden ark inside the Holy of Holies. The sides of the bottom of the ark were made of wood covered with gold. And the lid of the ark was of solid gold and was called the mercy seat. That ark, the ark in the Holy of Holies was intended by God to foreshadow Christ is clear from the fact that it kept something for us that no one else could keep. The Ten Commandments were kept in there, weren't they? It says... The Ten Commandments were inside the ark. And now, the other things were in there that totally disintegrated. By the time that uh, Solomon dedicated the temple, he brought the ark and to put it into the temple. And the only thing in the ark was the Ten Commandments, those stone tablets. The second version, remember? The first ones were thrown on the ground and destroyed because of sin. So those second tablets that Jesus wrote with his own hand, he wrote those Ten Commandments on those tablets of stone. They were inside the ark. He says, also inside the ark was a pot of manna, which represented the Lord Jesus as the bread of life, and Aaron's rod that budded. And how does one get a rod? He must cut it from a tree. And this fact that was the type of the death of Christ. But did you notice that this rod budded and blossomed? This was a type of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I just love reading this guy. He's, he's, he's got such insight about the tabernacle in our Lord. The wilderness tabernacle was not only made of wood. The wood was covered with gold. The wood is a type of our Lord's humanity. The gold typifies his deity. He's summing this up. Jesus was more than human. A merely human Christ would be of absolute no veil for me. Christ was beautifully human. We grant this. Socrates and Abraham Lincoln were also beautifully human. But after life's fitful fever, they sleep in the dust. When it is time for me to be put in the, my coffin and placed in my grave, and when I am six feet under the sod, what good will a human Christ be to me? I need someone, and I have someone, who can reach down through that dirt and take my hand with the grip of the lion of the tribe of Judah and say, come forth. He's talking about the deity of Christ. It's wonderful when somebody agrees with the scripture about the deity of Christ. You know, part of that falling away that we're talking about, that we see all over, people denying that Jesus is God. The Bible teaches it plainly, whether it be through um, the metaphors or the examples of the ark or of the tabernacle being covered with gold, and gold represents deity, but we know Jesus uh, was virgin born. We know that he lived a sinless life. And so when we think about a superior sanctuary, it's in a better place. Now, what, what's that? Where's the temple today? It's got a mosque on it, the Dome of the Rock. It's got an idolatrous building right where it used to stand. Where is the temple? It's destroyed. Where is the ark? Nobody knows. But now God's going to change all of that. You have to understand prophecy deals with that. We don't have to know where the ark is. In fact, there's an Old Testament passage that says the ark is not going to come back into their mind because the very presence of Jesus Christ will be their focus when he comes back and sets up his kingdom. So I want us to see it's a better place, heaven. We used to sing this song, heaven is a wonderful place. 
full of glory and grace. I'm going to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. But until the, remember that song, we'd sing those different melodies along together. Heaven is a wonderful place. And there's nothing wrong, as I've heard people meanly say, oh, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Well, I want to tell you something. You can be so earthly minded, you may not ever find out what heaven is like. You need to be heavenly minded. You need to desire to go there. Because Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And then secondly, it's a better priest. <laughs> it says, such a high priest. Do you remember those passages that mean so much to us back there from chapter 4, where he says, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. You can picture the priest, you know, come on, hurry up, next. Slit in the throat of another lamb, draining it out. Hurry up, get it. Next one. We got a lot to do here. He doesn't care. He's got a job to do. He doesn't think about the person who's bringing that lamb or that uh, whatever animal it was. His, he said, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points like as we are yet without sin. He knows whatever you're going through. He knows. He's been there. He can feel it. So we have such a high priest, verse 1. He is the, he's the best. He's the greatest. He's not one who has to walk around anymore and offer. He's already made it happen. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. In 1 John, it talks about we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our lawyer. He's our advocate. Why would we need a lawyer in heaven? <laughs> I don't even want one down here. How about you? <laughs> Unless he's with Christian law associations. But seriously, why would we need a lawyer in heaven, an advocate? Because our adversary, the devil, is also called the accuser of the brethren. And I don't know. We won't know this till we get to glory. Why does God allow Satan to have access at least to accuse us? Now, he, Satan isn't camping out in your mansion. Don't worry. He's not sleeping in heaven. But as a spirit being, he comes before God and accuses me and you regularly. Bible says night and day. Has he got any ammo? Oh, yeah. Has he, is he telling the truth? That big liar can still tell the truth. He does half truth. But he can tell the truth about you in your accusation because we're sinners. But Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is our lawyer, our advocate, he stands up for us. He is our intercessor. And so it goes nowhere. Jesus intercepts it as our intercessor. Don't ever forget that. He gets, and by the way, when you study the book of Revelation, there's coming a time in the middle of the future tribulation period when there's war in heaven between God's angels and Satan and his angels, and they're kicked out. They're no longer allowed. He no longer can come before God and accuse Dennis Tyson and accuse you. No longer. And that is toward the end of the, the last half of the tribulation period. But that's another matter. But we have such a high priest. Our Lord, wow. He's the greatest. Secondly, I want you to see the superiority of his sacrifice. You see that word here. It says, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices whereof it is necessary that this man have somewhat to offer. Now, this man is referring to Christ, and I'll, I'll try to explain it. You might have seen some um, pronouns that you didn't know who it was attached to. All right, this man is talking about Christ. He had somewhat to offer. Of course, he did. He offered his own blood. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to law. You know, when he comes back, he's going to reign as king of kings and lord of lords. Mm -hmm. But he has occupied prophet, priest, and king effectively at various times of his life and existence. Because at right now, he's our high priest. But he comes back to reign. So the Jews will occupy those positions as priests serving under God. And that will be reestablished. So the superiority of his sacrifice. Think about this. Go back to chapter 7. I, my Bible is open where I can look right at it. But I want you to look at verse 27. 
So it's a few, two verses before this chapter started. 727. Look at it. Who, now, by the way, verse 26, for such an high priest became us. Uh, what a great phrase. He became us in that he became a man. The incarnation. God became man. He became us in that he knows what we're going through. He suffered. And he was just as much human as he was. As he, he is just as much human. I shouldn't say was, past tense. He is just as much human as he is deity. He's God, man. But it became us who is, I love this verse, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. A unique, perfect, holy individual. No one else like him in all of the world or in all the universe. He's God, okay? Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice. So the superiority of his sacrifice, the earthly priest did it daily. And there was also one time a year that they would go into the Holy of Holies, only one time of the year. And it was very, very dangerous. If they were to do something wrong, they could be struck down dead. You remember Anadab and Abihu and some others in the Old Testament who crossed the line. God killed them. It was strict. It was set down by the law. And it was dreadful if somebody violated it. They were fried. They were killed. Even the ark had this ability. There was a man named Uzzah. And he stabled the ark. And he put his hand on it and he got killed. And uh, so, you know, it was not for fooling around with. But here, the superiority of his sacrifice is that he did it once. You go over to chapter 9. You, it, so it says here in 27, um, he says, This he did once when he offered up himself. I see the same theme toward the end of chapter 9 in that passage that we use to talk about the fact that it is appointed unto man once to die. In fact, listen to it. Um, so it says in 25, 925, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then he must have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 27, and as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Unto them that look unto him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So we see the comparison. The superiority of his sacrifice is that he only had to die once. And so that's a great difference. The earthly priest, daily. The he this heavenly priest, this heavenly high priest, once. And you know, that's why you only have to be saved once. He died for your sins once. You don't have to be saved over and over again. <clears throat> now, I did. You know my story that I went forward at six years of age in a church and heard hell, fire, and brimstone preaching. I was smart enough at six. I'm not saying I was brilliant. I knew enough that I didn't want to go there. I knew enough that the preacher was preaching and he gave an invitation and I tugged on my mom's skirt. I said, I need to be saved, mom. And she started crying and I started crying and we went down to that altar and the lady that dealt to me was crying and all we did was a bunch of crying. And they took me up and dunked me into the baptismal. And I went to um, Granny with Granny out to eat that afternoon. We went to a Morrison's Cafe. I'll never forget it. It was a great place to eat downtown that my grandmother loved. And we went there, and I told my mom and my dad, I got saved today, but I didn't. There was no understanding. It was just emotion. Now, for the next eight years until I'm 14, I'm hearing preaching that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, I didn't do that. Uh, that it, with the mouth the confession is made, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I didn't do that. And I wanted to, and I, I believed it, but nobody explained all that to me. I struggled with those things. I had nightmares. I saw evil faces in my dreams. I had all kinds of problems for those eight years. And finally, on a Sunday night, when I least expected it, when I wanted to be home watching football, that was the year the Miami Dolphins were, uh, you know, going to make it to their first Super Bowl. 
I wanted to be at home, but my mom and dad made me go to church. And I'm so glad they did. Because that night, I had the understanding and I got saved. I look at it this way. I was only saved once. I didn't get saved at six. Confusion reigned there. And sometimes we talk to kids here at church that want to get saved. And we say, well, didn't you get saved last year at BBS? Yeah, but I didn't really understand. I don't argue with them when they say that because I've been there. And so we take them through it again and hope that they will, you know? So it's great about this matter of the once. They did it daily. Jesus did it once. You only have to be saved once. And you cannot lose your salvation. Praise God. So thankful for that. So we see the superiority of the sanctuary that's in heaven compared to the one on earth. I wonder whatever happened to the old, uh, the old tabernacle. You know, they brought the ark from it. And they, uh, I, I just wonder, maybe they brought that veil out of the tabernacle and put it in the new temple. It's quite possible. The one that split as Jesus was hanging on the cross. I don't know. Those are questions that you wonder about. But I wonder whatever happened to all those curtains and the stuff that was made out of badger skins and the, all of the, the knops. Remember reading about the knops, the different things that they used to put things together so they could take it down and rebuild it, take it down and rebuild it. Remember, they did that for 40 years. But it got stuck somewhere in the middle of Israel until the days of Solomon and he built that temple. I just wonder whatever happened to that. It deteriorated somewhere. But there's a true tabernacle in heaven. It's a superior place, a superior sanctuary, and a superior sacrifice. It's the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. <laughs> Listen to what, um, I like this poem that he put in here, Dr. Edmont. Kind of, it's kind of moving. Into the woods my master went. Clean, for spent, for spent. Into the woods my master came, for spent with grief and shame. But the olives, they were not blind to him. The little gray leaves were kind to him. The thorn tree had a mind to him, as into the woods he came. He goes a couple of pages and finishes it. Out of the woods my master went, and he was well content. Out of the woods my master came, content with death and shame. When death and shame would woo him fast, from under the trees they drew him last. T'was on a tree they slew him at last, when out of the woods he came. Thinking about him coming out of that place called Gethsemane when he was arrested that night. And he went to die for us. One time, only once, did our Lord Jesus have to suffer. Praise God for that. And that's why we need to listen to the scriptures. It behooves us to listen to these passages. Why he was so great? Because he was superior to everything that came before him. Why he should be heard? Because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And there's only a certain window of opportunity in your life. And when that window of opportunity closes, by two possibilities, death or the rapture. And if you have not received the love of the truth, you don't want to be in that condition. You don't want to end up in hell. Now let's read on. And our final thought, look at the word serve in verse 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. I thought about the superiority of his service, Jesus' service. You know, Jesus was, he humbled himself even uh, to, the, to the death of the cross, but he humbled himself in his ministry. Remember how he would knelt down and wash their feet? And they were, you know, it was repulsive to Peter. He said, no, he said, if you don't let me, you're not mine. And he goes, well, then not only my feet all over you. No, that's not necessary. And he was trying to teach him <clears throat> service ministering to other people, not being so high and mighty that you can't do things for other people and serve other people. And that's what ministering is. And you'll see the word minister here as well in these passages. So <clears throat> the superiority of his service. Let's talk about Moses for a little bit. What a great man Moses was. And, you know, he didn't start out so, I mean, he started out 
in an ark of uh, reeds put into the river. Remember his mom put him out there to hopefully save his life. And I was teaching the other night in uh, our classes, and maybe I said it last Sunday night, don't know, remember when. You can divide Moses' life into three 40s. Uh, his first 40 years, he was grown up in the lap of luxury, wasn't he? He was in Pharaoh's daughter's house, and he was in the lap of luxury. And then after the events happened there where he killed an Egyptian and he had to run, then he was in the lap of hard work uh, over there in, in Midian. And then he came back and brought the people out, and then he was in that 40 years with those belligerent, hard-headed people. Amazing story to look at the life of Moses. It really is. But Moses represents something. He was the mediator of the old covenant. Moses represents the law. Moses was the one that God said, you come on up here. He went above the clouds up into that mount, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. The only person that was up there near him was jo um, Joshua, who was his minister. And he, he stayed a little bit away. Nobody else was supposed to come close. The Lord said, don't let anybody come near the mount. And it was, it was a fearful thing. And Moses was there. And uh, he was, he saw angels, the Bible said angels helped, but he was the mediator of that old covenant, the law to man. And God, in his magnificent way, with his finger, wrote the Ten Commandments onto a stone. Boy, I'd love to see what that writing looked like, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, I mean, he wrote it. And then they comes down the mountain, and some bad things are going on. It's kind of comical, but it's ridiculous as well. It shows how far people will lie to cover their sins, won't they? Aaron said, I put in some gold and out came this calf. <laughs> you read that, and it's, just, it's hilarious, but it's sad that he would lie like that. He made a golden calf, and the people were dancing around naked, bowing to this golden calf. Somebody asked the other day, weren't we talking about that the other night? What is the significance of these calves? I mean, Jeroboam made a calf for both uh, Bethel and for Dan. He made two golden calves. He outdid Aaron. And he led the northern tribes into abject idolatry. But that's not the point. The point is, what did he do with that tablets when he saw the people dancing around naked to a golden calf right there on the bottom? Of it? He threw them down and broke them all to pieces. I wouldn't doubt if you could go over there to Saudi Arabia right now, you might even find a shard, a piece of the original Ten Commandments laying there in the ground somewhere. I don't know. I don't think they would let you. If you got over there, you'd probably never get it back out. But I don't believe that it's in Sinai. I believe it's in Arabia, as Galatians says. But anyway, he was a mediator of a faulty covenant. Why was it faulty? Was the hey listen, Paul spends a lot of time in Romans talking about the fact that the law was holy and righteous and good. But where was the fault found with the human beings? They were sinners. They couldn't keep the law. They none of them could keep the law. What did we read up here in verse 26 about Jesus? Holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, higher than the heavens. Jesus kept the law. The only one that could. And he took it out of the way by nailing it to his cross. <clears throat> but I wanted you to see in the contrast the superiority of his service, Jesus' service. M Moses had a service too. Moses was a mediator too. And Moses had something written on dead stone tablets. And they, they had to be rewritten because he threw it down and it broke all to pieces. <laughs> Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. Have you ever read that verse in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5? There is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. I don't care what anybody says. There's no other mediators. There's only one, Jesus Christ. He is the one who stretched his arms out. And you can read a thousand years before it happened. You can read the same words that Jesus said. It was from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What an amazing passage. The Psalm of the Cross, Psalm 22. Jesus stretched out his arms. He ended up saying, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost. And he was laid in a tomb. 
But three days later, up from the grave, he arose. What a great thought. What a great fact. He's alive. Amen? Amen. The superiority of Jesus' service is it's better because it was written in their hearts rather than on a stone tablet. It is written in their hearts. Look at it. It goes on here in chapter um, 8. Let's pick it up about verse 6. But now hath he, and the he there is Jesus, obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. The old covenant, that's where we get the word testament, Old Testament, New Testament. Now you might say if the Old Testament is inferior to the New Testament, um, why don't we just get rid of the Old Testament and why don't we just preach out of the New Testament? Folks, we have the whole counsel of God, okay? We're not demeaning the Old Testament by saying that it is worthless. We're saying that it brought out the faults of man and Jesus was the only one to keep it. And so he brings a new covenant. It's different in so many ways. It would be better because it's written in their hearts rather than on stone. For finding fault with them, let's see, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then there should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. What was that group of people known for? Unbelief, murmuring, complaining. I'm almost done. Stay with me. This is, the, this is important right here. And so he says, not according to that, but because they continue not my covenant, I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. May I say this hasn't happened yet? Now, there are individual Jews getting saved. They're part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. They'll be raptured. They're not going to be left behind to go through the tribulation period. But as a nation, this hasn't happened yet. Romans eleven twenty six. So then all Israel shall be saved. That hasn't happened yet. Please keep that in mind. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. You know, I'm here today preaching. Know the Lord. There are preachers all over the nation preaching the gospel. All over the world, there are preachers in hiding, and they're still carrying on because they're being threatened. Their lives are being threatened, and they're still carrying on, but they're preaching. Know the Lord. Come to know him. Get saved. We won't have to do that when he's present with us. Because he's going to write it on the hearts. He says, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor to every one his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, a new covenant. He hath made the first old, now that which is decay and wax old is ready to vanish away. He took it out of the way. Praise God. And he's saying to us, My service is superior to whatever was done before me. Whatever Moses did was great, but Jesus is, is greater. And that's who we have to deal with, our Lord Jesus Christ. Last thing I want to read from Dr. Haynes' book. Let's see, it's page 44. <coughs> I love poetry that is biblical in nature. And there's a great one right here. This is what he says. Up that Calvary road, neath a terrible load, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> walked a man with a cross and a crown. And the cross that he bore and the crown that he wore with a deep agony weighted him down. For the cross was an emblem of sin and of blame, and the crown made of thorns was a circlet of shame. For the sins of the world upon his shoulders were hurled, on that blood-sprinkled Calvary road. Up the Calvary road, through the mob's cruel goad, to the brow of the hill he was led. And the sun hid its face, and the earth reeled apace, while his friends in ter dread terror had fled. But the pains that were his when the nails pierced him through 
were as nothing compared with the anguish he knew when the sins of the world on his shoulders were hurled on that blood sprinkled, sprinkled Calvary road. Lord, thank you for what you did for us, Lord. I pray to get a hold of every one of us to realize what you have done for us. You paid it all. You paid the price. You bore our sins in your body on that tree. Thank you. Thank you that you ever lived to make intercession for the saints. We thank you that right now you are performing the service in a superior way to what Moses did. You're our mediator between us and the Father. And we thank you that you're our advocate. Lord, we thank you that you stand up against Satan and his accusations, although they may be true about us. Most of the time, he's a liar. But we thank you, Father, that you stand up for us and you intercede for us because you paid it all with your own blood. Speak to somebody's heart today. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Turn to 310. Room at the cross for you.